Rahu back. Greetings, family, and to everyone out there. Today, we're going to focus on the Black Arab versus the Pale Arab. This video, we want to dedicate, it, dedicate this video to our sisters and brothers out there who are Muslims. And for those who may be interested in this subject matter, because as Nawapians, we have a very intimate connection and history to the Black Arab versus the Pale Arab subject matter. Because one of the things the master teacher has taught us, Dr. Malachi KZ York, going back into the 1970s, that we were Ansars, Ansar Allah. And the Ansars are a tribe of Muslims that originate from the Sudan in Africa. And it, what's interesting, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't you mean know about the Ansars. Yeah, a lot of people don't know about the Ansars, and a lot of people do not know about Muhammad Ahmed. We'll show a picture of Muhammad Ahmed, mm -hmm. the Mahdi, who was born in 1845, and he he transitioned in what was 1885. That? 1885. So he was on the planet for about 40 years, and his accomplishments conquering and defeating the British and the Egyptians and the Turks to to gain independence for the Sudanese people at that time from the rulership of the Egyptian, British, Turkish type of influence. And he declared himself the Mahdi. And this is something we were teaching for quite some time. And Muhammad Ahmed obviously is a black African, but he's also an Arab. And a lot of people today do not know that there are black Arabs and there are pale Arabs. Yeah, that would sound like a contradiction to say somebody's African and Arab. You know? Well, a lot of, I think a lot of the confusion comes from people like, not to say anything negative about them, but people like Dr. Clark and them, who were pushing this anti-Arab Muslim agenda type of thing, type teachings, saying that black people why are you, are you Muslim when that's a pale Arab, Arabs and slave trade and all that other stuff. And so the subject got convoluted. A lot of people don't know the history that there's a distinction between the black Arab and the pale Arab. Okay. And people think that Arab is some kind of race when Arab is no race. It is, it's just a, it's just an, uh, an Arabic word, or a Syretic word, or a Assyrian word, that just means, uh, some will say, uh, means to move from one place to another, or a Bedouin. They, they will, they'll say it means Bedouin, someone who's a migrant. Who, wanderers. Wanderers, yes. And so, when you begin to go into the origin of the word and the people that live that lifestyle, what you begin to research and find out that these are black African people who were living in what we call today the Middle East. So when you look at what you say the Arab world today, in particular Saudi Arabia, a lot of people do not know that the original inhabitants of Saudi Arabia were black African people. They were black, undeniably black. When you look at some of the history, you can find this. It's easy to trace, in fact. For instance, uh, some of the people that were ruling Arabia, when we go back to, let's say, 1000 BC, okay. right? 1000 BC, all the way up to 200 AD, 300 AD, around that area, the tribe of people who was ruling that were called the Sabaeic people. They say the Sabaeic or Sabian peoples, where you get the um, biblical uh, individual, the Sheba, the the ruler, the female ruler, she of Sheba. Okay. Right? They call her Queen Sheba, but as Nawapians, we do not use the word queen because that is a European word that. It's not a respectful terminology for our women. 
uh, in our language, in the Wapui, we'll say something like Nisutet, right? Nisutet, Sheba, or ruler, which means a ruler, a female ruler. But they'll say the Queen of Sheba for those who don't understand. And this is the origin of, of the Sabaic people. They, they have this story about how the, the ruler, the female ruler of Sheba meets King Solomon. Blah, 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 blah. It's a biblical story. But it's also a historical fact that the Sabaic people did exist, that the Sabaic people controlled, uh, I would say from Mecca, all the way down from Mecca into Yemen. So you go some Saudi Arabia area, so that, that, that central southern part of Saudi Arabia into what we call Yemen today, which were all the Sabaic people and I will now look at our language. I'll, this is where we're using the Sabaic script in the, Wa, in the Wapui, right? Which is, again, a black African people. Now look at the images of the Sabaic people. They have the, the woolly hair and the twists that our people wear the twist today. Uh, and so these are black African peoples, is the point. And they would, would you would be Arab. You would call them Arab. Now, also, historically, the, uh, the, the Arab people speak what they call the Arabic language. The Arabic language, its origin is of Soretic. That's its origin, Soretic, they say. So when you say Soretic, what do you mean by that? Soretic coming out of Syria. So this language traces back from Saudi Arabia into Syria, which were the Soretic people, or the ancient Syrian people who were are also considered Arabs back then, as well as they're considered Arabs today. Now, when you look at the Syrian people today, like that guy Assad, who they're fighting that Syrian war. Now, those are Caucasian Arabs, or that's what you call the Pale Arab, which you see today. But that's not who were the ancient people that ruled that land. Now here's an image, just so you guys can see, of some of the Syrian people that lived at that time. So, and now with these images, you can clearly see that they're black African. You can clearly see that they're black African. And these are the ancient Syrians. So, so now I'm just trying to show that the, there was a distinct black Arab group of people as well as a Palab group of people. The Palabs is who we see today ruling the Middle East. These are the rulers of, of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, uh, Yemen, and Syria, and Jordan. These individuals who are ruling today basically supplanted the black African Arabs. That's literally what they did because they have a unfortunately a racist agenda against the black Arabs. So a lot of people don't know this history. A lot of people think here in America that when someone says that they're a Muslim, that that's something that's coming from these pale Arabs. And this is not correct. This is not true. So we're saying that's not something implanted on us. That's not a culture that's imposed on us. We're saying that's something that was natural to it's us. It's an original it's culture. Islam is one of the things we taught when we were in Saw and Saw to Allah that Islam was our original way of life. Africa. You are from three major tribes there, sitting in that room. You are from the tribe of Sharia, the tribe of Ja'liya, and the tribe of Dongolawi. A combination of these tribes produced your many features, your many skin tones, and your many hues of color, as well as hair texture. From extremely kinky, and curly to wavy and almost straight. All of those are your characteristics as the real and true Arab. You are the descendants from Israel and descendants from Ismail. You are the descendants of Ibrahim and your true way of life is Al-Islam. You are the peacemakers that Jesus, the Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, spoke about when he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Allah. Islam was our original way of life. 
that's why uh, I always make the comment the brother Chuck he, he makes the argument that and he, he says it like it's a, oh, like it's a, a mistake. Islam is the wapi. Yeah, the, the Islam kind of is the wapi. that in the book. Yeah. The, all you gotta do is go to what is the wapi, the book, and we'll put it up so you guys can see it in page. I believe it's on page six. What is the wapi? And we and and kind of and you know, made it very quick, quite clear that Islam is the wapi because of what the word mean, not what you're seeing these pale Arabs do because the Caucasians have a history of taking black people's culture and altering it. Altering it to the point where it's not even recognizable. To the point where it's not us anymore. Which is why we're not dealing with that. That whole Islam, Muslim type of thing because they took our ancient culture and our ancient way of doing things and they just twisted it and turned it upside down. But the reason why we feel this video is important because people do not know the history. They don't know the history that there's a distinct difference between the black Arab and the pal Arab. That's all we're trying to say. And so, uh, just to give you some more data on this, just do a little bit of research and look at the, the Libyans. The rule, there's a ruling tribe of Libyan peoples, right? They're called the Sinosi tribe. This is a black, Arab, African tribe of people. The Sinosi tribe. Here's some images of some of the original rulers and leaders of the Sinosi. And as you can see in the images, you can see that they're Arab and they're by their dress, well, the dress that they have, but you can also see that they're black. They're African peoples. So the Sinosi tribe traced their lineage, their blood descendancy back to the Prophet Muhammad by way of the Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad's grandson, I forget it was Hussein or Hassan, I forget which one, but one of the sons, Hassan or Hussein, had a bunch of children and they traced their bloodline back to the Prophet Muhammad by way of his grandson. Historically, also, it, it is known that the Prophet Muhammad was of the black Arabs. He was not of the pale Arabs. Uh, I, tribe of people I should want to say. And then when you look at the 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 Ansars that I talked about earlier in this discussion, who are out of the Sudan, you can clearly see that the Ansars, there's an image of them, that they're black Arabs. And the the leader of the Ansars or the founders of the Ansars, Muhammad uh, Muhammad Ahmed Hamati, he traced his bloodline also back to the Prophet Muhammad's grandson, back to the Prophet Muhammad. And but the Sudanese right now in Sudan, in the early 70s, not in the 70s, in the early 80s when I was there, at my wife's house, her father, who has passed on, alayhi salam, Allah be with him, right? Gave me a child, not of my family. You know, it's not me, it's an old man who don't have no reason whatsoever to not me. I'm just a guy who lived in my house, I'm humbling myself, I'm tapping doing this. He has no reason to lie to me at all. Why? You understand what I'm saying? None at all. And he said, you know what? He gave me a list of names he had with me. All the way from Alabas. The uncle of the Prophet Muhammad. All the way from him. Name for name. An unbroken chain. An unbroken chain. A family member right down to his son. And this is my family time. In fact, I was going to tell you his name, but I realized that many times I asked him for a father. They all say, oh no. They don't know, they didn't know how old it was. That's how old it was, they didn't even know it was. That's the reason why I'm not praising themselves every birthday like you all do. Every birthday I'm going to kill you, kill you. He gave me a family charm from Alabaz, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad, here in Sudan, in a little village of Hasanisa, the northern province. Right, not quite far, but you know, right out of, up, above Khartoum. He had a family, child. 
shot at himself. What do you mean by that? Now, some of you don't like that, but that's the truth. Why does this man have to get, why, 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 why does this old man have to lie? You didn't want me to lie, especially to me. He don't know what I'm teaching. He didn't know that his daughter was buying a mad man from America. <laughs> Confusion coming up from, and uh, where where would we say these pair of Arabs are coming up from? Because if you ask most people today, what's an Arab? They would describe what you say as a pair of Arabs. How do you get to the point today where we have this confusion with you know pair of Arabs versus what we're saying black Arabs? Because obviously the black Arabs would be African. Where do these pair of Arabs come from? The the reality is is Caucasian propaganda. Because what Caucasians like to do is they'll go into a country and they'll only show the Caucasian people of that particular area and just exclude like black people don't live there. What do you mean by that? Because they don't look like your normal European. Like if you go to England, or you go to Spain or France, they don't look exactly yeah, like that. Yeah, because the, the Arabs today really have a Hindu or Indian origin. They come out of India originally those peoples and these are Indian or Hindu peoples who mixed in with Caucasian peoples this is how you get your people like in that lives in Turkey today so if you look at the Turkish people they have that dark you know that dark pale tan thing going on they usually have jet black hair and dark eyes so they're not your typical Nordic Caucasian and, and you kind of, you'll see even a more darkness with your Iranians and the Iraqis and your, your Syrians today and your Sardians, your Saudi Arabians. And so these are individuals who were Hindu or what you would call, today they kind of would call them the Aryan Hindu far from an ancestry point of view. Because it was known that the original Aryans, that Adolf Hitler coined that term, popular name, they were pale-skinned Hindus or light-skinned Hindus which 
if anyone who studies the Hindu culture or the Indian culture know that they have this caste system going on where the lighter you are, the more respect you get. The darker you are, you're ostracized. So they, because they have that thing called the, the untouchables. In okay. fact, there is a black African tribe living in India today, today, black Africans. I think they said they've been in India for the last 500 years. And they've been, they have, they have treated so bad. <laughs> They're treated really bad. In fact, if you do some research on them, we'll put up some clips so you can see. I forget the name, but you can see these these uh, groups of people that live in India today, and they're black, and they're from Africa. You're not talking about Javidians, are we? No, 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 not Javidians. No, no, these are black Africans. I think they were from the Congo. Okay. And they live in India. They were supposedly a part of so-called so kidnappy slave that was enslaved in India about 500 years ago. And then they ran away, they did that whole maroon thing, ran away and settled in these, um, in like this forest land in India. <laughs> and they're there today. And they're still being persecuted against by Indians. Okay. ಐದುನೂರು ವರ್ಷಗಳ ಹಿಂದೆ ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಆಫ್ರಿಕಾದಿಂದ ಭಾರತಕ್ಕೆ ಕರೆತರಲಾಯಿತು ನಾವು ಯಾವ ಭಾಗದಿಂದ ಬಂದಿದ್ದೇವೆ ಎಂದು ನಮಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತಿಲ್ಲ ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಗುಲಾಮಗಿರಿಗಾಗಿ ಭಾರತಕ್ಕೆ ಮಾರಲಾಯಿತು ಮತ್ತು ಸಾಗಿಸಲಾಯಿತು ನಾವು ಭಾರತಕ್ಕೆ ಬಂದ ತಕ್ಷಣ ವಸಾಹತುಗಾರರಿಂದ ತಪ್ಪಿಸಿಕೊಂಡು ದಿನಗಳವರೆಗೆ ಕಾಡಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಓಡಿ ಇಂದು ಭಾರತದಲ್ಲಿ ಜನರು ನಮ್ಮನ್ನು ಸಿದ್ಧಿ ಜನರು ಎಂದು ಕರೆಯುತ್ತಾರೆ ಸಿದ್ಧಿ ಎಂದರೆ ಪ್ರಬುದ್ಧವಾದದ್ದು still be in person i mean these are black people they speak the hindi language they dress like the hindus they even have adapted hindu culture so i'm just bringing that up because the hindus have this whole thing against black people right they're very racist against black people the hindus and so when you look at the the what they call the hindu aryan this is where you're Pell originally comes from, which would be identified as your ancient Persians. The ancient Persians, right? Were these Hindu-like peoples who invaded the Middle East years ago, thousand years ago, a couple thousand years ago. They invaded the Middle East, mixed in with the indigenous black people and produced this mix, hodgepodge of what they call them pal arabs today they call them pal arabs today they call them pal arabs today my point is is that there's the pal arab strand that lives in the middle east they're dominant there but there's still the african strand who've been oppressed oppressed by the pal arabs because when you start doing research on islam you kind of find out that the prophet muhammad was basically killed by these pal arabs and his family ran out of Saudi Arabia. They was pushed out of Saudi Arabia into Egypt. That's where his family settled, in Egypt, literally. So, and then the Pal Arabs took over right after Muhammad died, and this is when they do this all-out all out war on African peoples invading Northern Africa. And this is the history that our people know. 
This is why your black historians and all that. Yeah. Yes, okay. they they know they know the history of the Arabs invading Africa, and that's why they don't want nothing to do with no damn Arabs. But they don't know that the that like Islam and Muhammad and all that stuff. These were the pale Arabs who were part of Muhammad's organization at the time, and they got rid of Muhammad, and then came all these invading wars into Africa. Muhammad had nothing to do with that historically. Well, I want to uh, ask a question about the culture, let's say, of Islam for a minute. We say that Islam is really Nawapu, or Islam is really an African culture. Yeah. But most people, it seems like most people wouldn't identify with that, the way you say Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben, them don't, because it doesn't really have the markings, doesn't really look like African tribe. Like, when you look at the clothing, they're not wearing African print. So how do we, how will we show that Islam is really a part of African culture? Yeah, but when you look at the, it is, because when you look at the outer, the dress, like the dress of the Ansar was a long white jellabed, white robes. And these white garments we wore in ancient Egypt. So look at the images we'll show of the ancient Egyptians. They wore white robes, white garments. Same thing that the Ansars wore. These, these white robes, these white garments. Same thing, the image we have of the ancient Syrians. They wore this long white robe. So this is an African dress. It's an African dress that our ancestors did wear. And uh, when you start doing research on the real, how can I say, Muhammad, let me do it like this. The Prophet Muhammad was a mystic, okay? The Prophet Muhammad was a mystic, right? This is how he even received the Quran because he used to go into a cave meditate and this is where supposedly he meets this being he he he's he identified or was called the angel gabriel right and this being interfaces with muhammad and gives him this this doctrine okay supposedly gives him this doctrine this is the origin of the quran whether that's true or false that's not my point but here's my point is that muhammad and his family had a mystical teachings. When someone meditates and, and does meditation retreats in a cave, lets you know, okay, this is a spiritual individual. And the Quran backs that up by saying that the Prophet Muhammad made these spiritual trips or these, um, we'll call the, they call the Isra, a journey, a spiritual journey. Supposedly, he somehow time traveled on this, this thing they call Buddha, Buddha, uh, yeah, Buddha. Right. Yeah, uh, and they identified as some flying mule or something like that at that time. We had, we would identify, someone claims that they time traveled basically and they was taken out of body or their body was taken up into these other realms because it said he was taken up into the heavens, the seven heavens or whatever. So that would be, today they were identified as an abduction. Point being is that Muhammad was in tune with higher spiritual beings. That's the point, okay? So they had the spiritual teachings. And the spiritual teachings of Islam, when you research that, you find the ones who teach that are identified as the Sufi. And so when you start doing history on the Sufi and the origins of the Sufi, it takes you back to ancient Egypt, spiritual teachings. In fact, one of the most prominent Sufi uh, scholars and historical figures was an individual by the name of Du Nun. Du Nun. Du Nun. We'll put up the spelling so you have it. Du Nun was uh, supposedly able to read the hieroglyphs. He was a Sufi master. Right? So he was fluent in Egyptian culture. Sounds just like the, the elder Hakim, the wise. Yes. Yes, put him up. Yeah, because this is when you well when you start researching the Sufi, you find out that majority of the Sufis live in Egypt today and the Sudan. In fact, they have like twenty over twenty five million Sufis that live in Egypt. 
and I, I forget, I'm not sure how many millions of Sufis that live in the Sudan. Okay, and yeah, he claims to uh, that they read, well, they call it the Suf language, the same as the hieroglyphs. So yes. I guess we'll put we'll put that video yeah, of him see, up in there. Yeah, and the uh, pyramid code. Yeah. Hakim Awiyan is an indigenous wisdom keeper who was born in the village of Abu Sir. He trained in Europe as an archaeologist. Hakim lived his whole life in the area known as the Band of Peace. The Giza Plateau was his front yard. 1936 37, the Sphinx then was covered with sand up to the neck. And there was my playing yard. There are tunnels I used to walk in these tunnels. In water, I used to crawl sometime because it's narrow. At Abu Jarab, we have a crystal altar, round disc in the middle of four, a symbol of Hotep. And the word Hotep means peace and food. This uh, round disc, it's a, a lid on a shaft about 180 feet deep to the level of the uh, ocean. And that is still running water in there and you can feel it while you in the area. These instruments were not found in a line like you see today, it's uh, nine of them, but they found around the area. And there is still some more to be found. And then we have oldest obelisk located in Egypt. Next to that altar, what's left of the, what you call hieroglyph writing, that's a Sufi writing. It had the obelisk and the disk of the sun and word saying, the heart of the sun, Ibra. Yes, that, that Sufi, Sufism, is a ancient Egyptian spiritual practice. It comes out of ancient Egypt. And you have tons of Egyptians, right? Indigenous Egyptians who said that they was, yeah, that natural culture was Sufism. And that's something if you study that guy, Mustafa Gudala, he makes that argument that they're not Muslim, not the, they're not that pale Arab Muslim. They have nothing to do with that. In fact, they embraced the Sufi part of Islam because it was similar to the ancient mystical teachings of ancient Egypt, right? Just so that the, uh, how can I say, the pale Arab Muslims wouldn't persecute them. And this is what the Egyptians teach because if you look up the Egyptian people that live in Egypt, the native population of Egyptian today are called the Baladi people. The Baladi people. And if you look at it, we'll show some images of them. You can see the blackness in them. You can see that they've been mixed in because keep in mind, when Egypt was invaded first by the Persians, right? Then Egypt, and that was like around 500 BC. Then they got invaded again by the, the Greeks, by Alexander the Greek, and that was around 300 BC. And then they got invaded again by the Romans, right? With Ale well, um, no, uh, Caesar, yeah. right? Him and him, and him, him and his relationship with Cleopatra, and they were mixing in because she had a child with Caesar. So yeah, and then Mark so, Anthony, right? So now you got the Romans, and that was like one BC, and then they get invaded again by the Pell Arabs, right? Muhammad, um, what was his name? Ali Muhammad, not Ali Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, right? On um, around, ooh, forget when they came. They came into Egypt like six something or seven something AD or whatever. I will put up the date. So, ancient Egypt was constantly being invaded by different races of people, Caucasians in particular, and Persian Hindu-like peoples. So that's why the Egyptians, the Egypt, ancient Egyptians who did not want to be a part of that hodgepodge, they migrated out of Egypt into Africa. 
Some went into Southern Africa. already in Africa. You mean South? Yeah. Um, <laughs> they migrated, yeah, because they, you know, they got yeah, to go do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, you still, I still read that. Egypt is in the Middle East. They, Africa. they still. <laughs> <laughs> that brainwashing is good that they did on us. But, yeah, no, no, no. So, the African Egyptians who were living at the time of, the, of these invasions, a lot of them migrated into inner Africa. So some went south, others went west. This is why you have some tribes in Ghana today said that they came from Egypt. I forget the name of the tribe. In fact, we'll, we'll put it up. But they claim they came the the Gaul people, the Gaul people, I think it's like G-A-O, something like that. But they say they came out of Egypt. And then the Dogon say the same? The they Dogons mean? make the claim. There's a claim that someone said the, the Goa, the, excuse me, the Dogon is coming out of uh, ancient Egypt. Uh, the the Basa, the Basa uh, is is alleged to, to be an Egyptian tribe that came out of ancient Egypt, which was a part of the 25th dynasty, the Tahaka and the, okay. the Abasa, which is where they get the name in Ethiopia, Abyssinia. Mm. Abyssinia, the name Abyssinia, like they got the famous Baptist church in, in Harlem, at the Abyssinia Baptist Church. That's Abbasa. That's where the origin of the name comes from. A lot of people don't know that, right? So again, so you had, when these invasions were coming in, you had a lot of native Egyptians that were moving into inner Africa. They were either going south or west. But not everyone left at all. Not everyone left. I mean, naturally, not everyone would leave. And so you you had people that stayed there. This is why when you look at that guy, what's that guy? That Count Vonnet, that in the 1700s he wrote that book where he was where he was talking about the Caucasian guy who wrote the book and went to Egypt and okay. he saw black African people living in okay, Egypt that's right. and he was like yeah, the original sure. Egyptians. He, he said you can clearly see that these They're people African, were yeah. African. So not everyone left. I know we, we kind of say that in the so-called conscious community. They kind of make it clean, like you know, there's no original indigenous people still there, but that's just not realistic. Yeah. Cause I guess part of the issue is because we're not over there and we don't have access to them kind of places and we don't rule there yeah. the way we used to. We don't, we're not able to see because most of the time, you know, at least what I've seen, they only show like the most northern parts and the most densely populated areas. areas you know, I mean, you see that all around the world. They, they really claim there's the two tribes of Egyptians now in, in Egypt today which is the Baladi people okay. and the Afghani people. They say the Afghani people are the leadership and they're the ones who are the migrants into the country. Maybe of um, Turkish origin, I don't know, Greek origin, whatever. But they say that the Afghanis are not the indigenous, but the Baladi people are the indigenous. And they're the ones who are predominantly Sufi. That's the key, they're Sufis. Right? And there's millions of them, is my point. Just like there's millions of Sufis in the Sudan, is my point. And this traces back to Egypt. That's why we look at Muhammad Ahmed, and you look at his flag, yeah. and you see the pyramids. Yeah. So he identifies with ancient Kemet, is, is the point that there's a connection there. This is one of the reasons why we're having this, this discussion. So, yeah, when you look at uh, Muhammad Ahmed, uh, the Mahdi, they connected with Egypt. When you look at, like I said, the Baladi people today, you do research on that. It's definitely that guy, Mustafa Gudala. That's all he does is, is focus on the fact that, you know, our, our or their origins is ancient Egyptian origins. And he acknowledges this guy acknowledges that the, a lot of Egyptians and during that time left and migrated into Africa. So he he's aware of that just as much as... You that. You mean South and... I know, right? South and... They migrated, <laughs> right. They migrated South and West. Yeah. He acknowledges that. Okay. You know, I don't agree with everything that guy says, but there are things that I do agree with what he, what he talks about because he has his this huge dislike for Muslims, <laughs> Mustafa Gandala, because he, because, because the reality is this, look at this, look at this article. 
the Sufis are constantly being persecuted by Sunni Muslims in Egypt. I mean, they're killing them. They've been persecuting the Sunni, the Sufis for eons. That's why a lot of Su a lot of uh, Muslims, Sufi, uh, Sunni Muslims, they don't want nothing to do with the Sufis. They, because they think that's not Islam. Yeah. They honestly think that has nothing to do with Islam. Now, if you notice, it's the Egyptians that are Sufis, and it's the uh, the, the Sudanese that are Sufis, yeah. as well as the Sunosi tribe in Libya. They're Sufis as well. Gotcha. Although the Sunosi tribe, they mixed out their bloodline, so when you look them up, you know they're pale now. Yeah. They, they've been mixing. They've been mixing out. In fact, they're allegedly the ones responsible for um, getting Gaddafi out. Really? Yes. But at the same time, Gaddafi allegedly, it was the Sunosis that he took out of power. Hey, he did this coup back in the 70s and took them out of power. Gaddafi said that was you know, kind of payback. That's some of the history with what's going on in Libya. Okay. But, but yeah, no, it is, it is quite interesting that the ones, the dominant uh, groups of people that still live by the Sufi culture happen to be in a place where the ancient Egyptian culture was practiced yeah. in Egypt and Sudan. Yeah. And that's the dominant area that they live in. This, see, and this gets into, and I'll touch a little bit on, on we were talking about uh, the brother Ujawa, yeah. of Rock Squad. We know him as Rick, who, was a, who used to be a, a Nawapian. And he made that video that Chuck put up about how a lot of people who are in America talking about these spiritual practices don't realize that these spiritual practices they're talking about go back to Madame Black of Askey, you know? That's his claim, yeah. Yeah, Madame Black of Askey, Alex the Chloracol, whatever, Crowley, whatever the heck his name is, and, and these Caucasian people who was into spiritualism, which they try to claim that that's where the master got a lot of his information from, these, these Caucasians. Yeah things are trying to grab our attention and influence us and sometimes it happens behind our back or on a subconscious level and we don't even know it so likewise there's a lot of teachings that are out there there are a lot of doctrines that are out there that are influencing us and I'm putting and I'm saying the conscious community in quotes that are influencing the conscious community whether we are aware of it or not and many people are not aware of it and I'm not saying that it's um, any particular people's fault for that, but we can do better. And how we f fix that is by studying, by putting in the work. And I'm just bringing this to people's attention that one such person and group of people is Madame Blavatsky and the, the, uh, the Doctrine of Theosophy and the Theosophical Society. There's other groups. There's the Rosicrucians. There's the Order of the Golden Dawn. There's... Um, some other uh, like uh, groups. You have Alistair uh, Crawley. Um, who else? You got other people who are heavily influenced. The whole New Age movement that we are familiar with today is is stands on a lot of these people that I'm mentioning. Their doctrines, you know, um, claiming to be a medium for for spiritual entities or extraterrestrials. That's found right there in in the uh, theosophy, um, you know, a lot of the different new age uh, concepts and themes that we see floating around in the conscious community are coming directly out of these groups. All right. So we have to keep that in mind. Irregardless, if you if if you think that these things were practiced in Africa, it's just that you're not going to Africa directly to learn directly from the Africans. So either way you look at it, um, the point is that we all have to do better. We have to go to the source and we have to stop being lazy. And so I'm just alerting people to this particular uh, uh, woman and everything she's affiliated with. But let me. All right. And and obviously to the people who were posting opposing my post. I guess that wasn't good enough. So then I expanded that and said that anybody that follows the astral projection, look that up. The third eye stuff, look that up. You're going to see, I guarantee you, when you look up the third eye uh, uh, doctrine and practices, look up the astral projection, the outer body, um, astral body. Look that up and I guarantee you, 
you're going to see Madame Blavatsky's name mentioned or the Theosophical Society mentioned or Theosophy as a philosophical doctrine mentioned. Guarantee it. And I mean, that's a weird, that's a very weird claim. Ujau, my brother, that's, a, that's just not accurate. <laughs> that, I mean, that's just not accurate because I, don't get me wrong, right? The people, black people did study people like that, right? Noble Jolie and them. But Noble Jolie did go to Africa, okay? It is recorded that the brother did go to Africa and did study in Africa. So just because he might have had some influence with the teachings of the, the with the theophile, um, I'm the theosophical the, society. Yeah, theosophical yeah. society. That doesn't mean that that brother still wasn't influenced by Africans. So I don't think that's a good assessment or a fair assessment. And you know, the master clearly has a connection with the Sudan, and the Sudanese, as I've been saying, are Sufis, and they acknowledge Egypt. They acknowledge the Egyptian doctrine, mystical teachings. We even talked about, I guess we should show that in the book where the master is referencing at the beginning of the teachings he called the organization Pure Sufi. Yes, yes, and yes, this is why, think about it, we were considered Muslims and Sars and we we're putting out books like The Science of the Pyramids and the Egyptian Pharaohs and we was doing this in the 70s. So we acknowledge our African origins as Ansars, as Muslims. And so this whole thing about getting information from Madame Blakovsky, that's that's just not that's not correct. Because the reality is that Madame Blakovsky, as he did say in his video, Ujjawa, he did say that these individuals allegedly got this information from Africa. So he was saying he was trying to make the argument, why don't go to the source? My brother, they did go to the source. <laughs> they get they did go to the source. And what a lot of people don't they don't comprehend. Panabab was taking information from some of these individuals' books who they were plagiarizing. They were stealing this information from Africa. Plagiarizing that information as if it was theirs. Like that guy, we'll go, we'll go into that in another video, but that guy I keep talking about that wrote the so-called wrote the breath book, that Caucasian guy. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? I forget his name, but That's he put, that he put it under that. Um, right, we'll put his picture up. He put it under that pseudonym of a Hindu. Yeah, that, a Hindu, guy. Hindu Rama, Yogi, Rama, Yogi Rama, whatever, whatever, whatever. Listen, that I said it before and I'll say it again. That Caucasian guy did not write those books. I got evidence of that. He didn't write those books. Those are plagiarized books. So y'all trying to think that the massive plagiarized from this? No, nah, that's a lie. But y'all don't know the history of those individuals who were studying because if you do some research well listen i don't want to make this longer than what it is but i'm gonna just do something real quick the key is the moors that's the key the moors of ancient spain and i wouldn't say ancient spain but the moors of spain back in the 700s you know the the, the 8th century 9th century a.d that's the key that was the beginning of the Caucasians getting some real profound knowledge that was coming out of the continent. And so that knowledge carried on and it, it, it what, it's what produced your, 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 um, what's the guy, Galileo. It's what produced your what, Vinci, Isaac, Newton. Vinci, uh, Isaac Newton. Isaac okay. it, Newton. It's what, it's what spawned all of this particular knowledge in science in the 1800s, okay? These teachings, especially when the Caucasian got access to all of Africa, because we gotta keep in mind, the Caucasian conquered the planet in the 1800s. By the, 18, by the late 1800s, by 1870s, 1890s, they had the whole planet on lock, and they were ciphering all of this knowledge from Africa. That's just an actual fact, okay? And so, when you see Caucasians talking like this, when we all know for a fact, Caucasians are not spiritualists. That's just not who they are by nature. They're not a spiritual people. They are materialistic people, right? That's not a part of their culture or doctrine. So I'm bringing that up and making these connections because a lot of people don't know that there's a thing of a black Arab versus a pale Arab, and they don't know the origin of the black African Arabs. 
They don't know our origin. They honestly do not know the origin. And so I, I think for that purpose, that's why we're trying to clear these things up. And we gave, a, we gave a lot of data. So take your time, like we say in all our videos, take your time. I recommend watching it more than once because if this if it's subject matter is new to you, and if you uh, and if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to, to email me. Again, my name is Petty Sina Teptu Ray A. And make positive comments. Make positive comments again. And to all, support, subscribe, press thumbs up. I like this video. And become a member of nuplecc.com.